Hi guys, Miss Marusik here, and in this video we're going to talk about solving limiting reactant stoichiometry problems. Now in this first page we have a list of reminders about solving reaction stoichiometry problems. Uh, as far as our steps are concerned, we would first want to get ourselves a balanced reaction written. That enables us to have the coefficients ready to do our multiple ratios. Next, I like to map out a game plan. I like to see where am I starting? Where am I trying to get to? And plan out those conversions I would need to get between those two steps. It really does help us be more successful in problems if we take the time to map out a game plan. If you've never made a game plan before, I will actually show you how to do that here in just a few minutes. Next, I would calculate. Now we have to be very careful on our stoichiometry steps. We wanna make sure we are showing those units on our conversions when we're setting them up. We want it to be very clear to the AP graders that they know exactly which conversions we're doing as we're going through these problems. If we're not taking the time to label our steps with both a unit like grams or milliliters or moles, as well as what substance we have, then we're not fully communicating the information needed for that conversion. So make sure you're doing a good job with labeling your steps. Next, we have the list of different types of conversions that we could use with these problems. Um, obviously, if we're going between moles and moles, we would use a mole ratio. I didn't write that on here, but that's kind of the one step that you would always have in these problems. Uh, next, if we're going between moles and mass, we would use the molar mass. If we're going between moles and particles, we would use Avogadro's number. Uh, moles and volume of a pure liquid, we would be given the density to make that conversion. If we have a gas, we have two options. First, if we have a gas at STP conditions, standard temperature and pressure, we can use 22.4 liters equals one mole. If we have a gas that is not at STP conditions, then we can use PV equals NRT. Just as a reminder, the R values are given to us on our formula chart, so you might have to look those up. Also, be careful if the gas was collected over water, because what that means is that the pressure that they give us, we would need to subtract off the water vapor pressure before we utilize it. And the va water vapor pressure should be given to us somewhere in the problem itself. Um, if we have moles and volume of a solution, then we can use molarity as a conversion factor. We also have several different types of percentages that we can calculate with these stoichiometry problems. Uh, the one that we see the most often is this percent yield calculation, where we have our experimental, our actual value that we get when we do the experiment in a laboratory setting. Um, over the theoretical yield. The theoretical is what I'm getting from a calculation, from stoichiometry that says, hey, this is the maximum amount that I should be able to make if everything went perfectly according to plan. So by comparing those two in the ratio and multiplying by 100, I can calculate what's called that percent yield. How much did I yield in comparison to what I should have been able to make? Um, I also have down here several tidbits about limiting reactant problems. However, we're going to talk about a lot of these steps as we do our first problem. So with that said, let's go ahead and turn the page to the next problem. What they give us here is some information about a reaction. They say, hey, we have 15 grams of calcium metal, 50 milliliters of six molar hydrofluoric acid. That's gonna get combined and produce hydrogen gas and calcium fluoride. And you notice the first thing that they ask us to do on part A is to write a balanced reaction for the process. So I would have my calcium. It is an element by itself, but it's not diatomic. So I'm just gonna write CA plus my hydrofluoric acid, which is HF. Fluorine is negative one, so it only takes one hydrogen to balance it out. Then that's gonna make hydrogen gas. Now that too is an element by itself, but it is a diatomic, and so we wanna make it H2. And then I make a precipitate of calcium fluoride. Now calcium has a charge of positive two, Fluorine has a charge of negative one, so that's gonna make CaF2. Now, if you wanted to go put states with these, you could. Um, one of the last things I need to do, though, is balance this with coefficients. I have two hydrogens and two fluorines on the product side, so on the reactant side, I need to come over here and put a two. So now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start to lay out some of the information that they give me in the problem. So they tell me up here that I have 15 grams of calcium metal. So under calcium, I'm going to put that I have 15 grams of it. 
for the hydrofluoric acid, they tell me I have 50 milliliters of six molar hydrofluoric. Now, I know when I'm dealing with molarity, it's really helpful to have that volume in liters because molarity is moles over liters. So I'm going to go ahead and convert that milliliters by moving my decimal over three places. And so that would give me 0 0.0500 liters. Okay. And then I notice in part B, it asks how many grams of calcium fluoride could theoretically be produced. So over here under calcium fluoride, I'm going to put question mark grams. Now here's the issue. I don't know right now which of these reactants is going to determine how much product I could make. If they had only given me amount of calcium, well then I assume that the calcium would limit how much calcium fluoride I could make. But the problem is, is I have an amount of both reactants. And whenever I see an amount of both reactants and I'm asked to solve the amount of product, what that means is that I have a limiting reactant problem on my hands. I'm going to have to take both of these substances and figure out how much product they can make. And then by comparing those values at the end, I can decide what the maximum amount of calcium fluoride is that I should have been able to make. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to go ahead and map out calculating calcium to calcium fluoride, map out calculating uh, hydrofluoric acid to calcium fluoride, and then after we do the calculation, we'll compare our two answers. So let's do our map for the calcium. I know I need a mole to mole ratio every time I do these kinds of problems to get between one substance and another. So you can either write mole ratio here, you can write MR as an abbreviation, but in any case, that step is gonna be utilizing the coefficients. To get between grams and moles here, I would need a molar mass step. I'm gonna abbreviate that with MM. Here I'd be using the molar mass of calcium. On this side, I have a step between moles and grams as well, and so therefore, again, I will need a molar mass except this time I would need the molar mass of calcium fluoride. So I can see here that that calculation is going to have three steps to it. However, I'm going to go ahead and also lay out the hydrofluoric acid conversion. I know, again, I need to go and use a mole to mole ratio. I would need to go moles to grams here yet again. But over here, I need to get these values into moles. Now you have some options here. You could do a calculation with molarity and liters and solve moles, and then use that moles as your starting place here. So a molarity calculation and then stoichiometry. Or you can use that molarity as a conversion factor between liters and moles, which is the way I'm going to do it. So now that I've written out both my maps, I'm going to go ahead and show you my calculations I did for these. Now hopefully now that you see these maps, you could go and calculate these yourself. Um, so I'm not going to talk through these very simple reaction stoichiometry problems from start to finish, but I am going to kind of give you the quick rundown here. So what I did on this first one is I have my 15 grams of calcium that I'm starting off with. Going back up here, I'm first utilizing the molar mass from calcium into moles of calcium. Then I set up a mole to mole ratio between calcium and calcium fluoride. That's a one to one because they both have coefficients of one. And then I went moles back into grams of calcium fluoride using its molar mass. So that got me a value of 29.2 grams of calcium fluoride that are possible from the mass of calcium that I had. I then did the same thing with the hydrofluoric acid. For that one, I started off with my volume of 0.05 liters that we converted. And then I said, hey, utilizing that molarity, molarity tells me how many moles there are per liter of solution. So what that means is for that six molar, I said that that is six moles for every one liter. So then I could go and do a mole to mole ratio. Here it was a two to one ratio because the coefficients are two and one. And then I did a moles back to grams molar mass just like I did on the previous calculation. And so that got me a value of 11.7 grams of calcium fluoride that are possible from the hydrofluoric acid. So here's the issue. Calcium can make 29.2 grams of product. 
hydrofluoric can only make 11.7. So the problem is, is that I'm going to run out of hydrofluoric before I can use all of that calcium up and get this bigger value. So what that means is that when I get these two numbers, I want to pick the smaller of the two as my answer for the mass of calcium fluoride I can make. The maximum amount of calcium fluoride that you're going to be able to make is 11.7 grams. I will not be able to make that 29.2 because I'm going to run out of hydrofluoric acid. Hydrofluoric acid is only capable of making 11.7 grams. Now what that means is that hydrofluoric is our limiting reactant. And the other reactant, the calcium, would be in excess. Now once I have that part identified, I do go back and make myself a note on my map. So I would come back up here and I would say, hey, this calcium was in excess. And this hydrofluoric was limiting. Now I do that because at this point, any other stoichiometry work I may do, I always want to start off with this limiting reactant here. This excess reactant of 15 grams, I am never going to use all of that. So I can't use that in any other stoichiometry steps to go solve other things. Okay. So now the next part of this problem says, hey, how much of the excess reactant is theoretically left over at the end of the reaction? So let's think about that 15 grams for a minute. I know I had that much of calcium, but I'm not going to use all that. I'm only going to use a little bit of it. And so what we need to do is figure out how many grams of this I'm actually using up. And so to do that, any new stoichiometry steps, I always start off with my limiting reactant. So I'm going to take this limiting reactant, and now I'm going to go and calculate how many grams of calcium I'm going to actually use to react all that hydrofluoric. And you can see I kind of already have my stoic laid out for me, and so now all I have to do is actually set up the calculation. So with that said, here's what I did for my calculation. I said, hey, I'm trying to figure out the grams of calcium that I used, starting off with my volume of hydrofluoric acid. I then used my molarity. One liter is for six moles of hydrofluoric. Then I did my mole to mole ratio. For every two moles of hydrofluoric, there's one mole of calcium. So there's my two to one ratio. And then I said, hey, for every one mole of calcium, it's 40.08 grams, that's that molar mass step to get back up there. And what I figured out is that I only used 6.01 grams of calcium. I didn't use all 15 grams. So to figure out how much was left over at the end, I would take how much I had, the 15 grams, I would subtract off how much I used, which was the 6.01 grams, and that would get me how much calcium was left over. So again, a had minus used subtraction will get your amount left over of that excess reactant. All right, the next part of this problem says, hey, the hydrogen gas, this other product, is collected over water at a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius and an atmospheric pressure of 765 torr. What is the volume of hydrogen gas that could be collected? So I'm looking for a volume here. And let's be real, I'm probably going to solve that in liters. You could pick, but liters is probably the easiest to report this in. You'll see why in a minute. And I notice they give me a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius, and they give me a pressure of 765. And so what I need to do is do some stoichiometry from that limiting reactant to figure out how much of this H2 I can actually produce. Now that will mean that I will have a mole to mole ratio here to get back and forth between these. And that also means that I'll be using that liters to moles conversion again in order to get into moles. Now at this point here is where it gets kind of interesting. If this had been a gas at STP conditions, I could have used 22.4 liters is one mole. But I can't use that here because these were not STP conditions. And so therefore, I'm going to use Pivnert. Now the way this is going to work, 
I have my temperature. I have my pressure. I'm going to calculate moles from my stoic. So then I'll plug that in for N. R I can get off of my formula chart. And so that would enable me to solve the volume here. And so that's how we're going to do this. So to start us off, I want to figure out from using stoichiometry, how many moles of H2 can I make? So then I can plug that into PivNert. And so I would start off again with my limiting reactant here of the hydrofluoric acid. And so I did one liter to six moles. So there's that molarity step. And then I said, hey, for every two moles of HF, I make one mole of hydrogen gas. It's a two to one ratio there. And so when I do that calculation, that gets me a value of 0 0.150 moles of H2. Now, here's where you had to be careful back up here. I know I put 765 as a pressure, but if you notice this problem, it did say it was collected over water. It mentions that statement right here. And at the end of it, it told you the water vapor pressure at 20 degrees Celsius is 17.5 torr. So what that means is that this pressure was both the pressure of the gas as well as the pressure of the water. So before I can use that 765 in PivNert, I needed to subtract off the 17.5 torr. So you notice as I come down here, when I plugged in that pressure right here, I said, hey, that's gonna be 765 minus the 17.5. Um, and so you could subtract that before you plugged it in or you could plug it in as part of your work. I then continued plugging in my pieces to Pivner. My volume is my unknown, so that's what I'm trying to solve. My N is that 0 0.150 moles that we solved in the stoichiometry up above here. R, I pick this value from my formula chart. I want to pick one that matches up with my pressure unit. So I used a 62.36 value from my formula chart. And then my temperature, I converted the degree Celsius into Kelvin. So 20 plus 273 is 293 Kelvin. Um, to solve volume, I would divide over that difference in the pressure. And that gets a value of 3.67 liters of H2 at the end. All right, there's one more piece to this problem that they ask us to solve, and that is that when the reaction was conducted in laboratory, the precipitate was filtered out, dried, and masked. And it tells us here that we actually produced 9.50 grams of calcium fluoride when we did this experimentally in lab. And so it wants us to figure out what the percent yield of the reaction would be. Now, I do need a piece of information from earlier. I need to remind myself how much calcium fluoride was actually possible. And if we think back here, we solved earlier that I should be able to make a maximum of 11.7 grams. However, this is saying that I'm only making 9.50 grams. So my percent yield would be that actual value from lab of 9.50 over that 11.7 that we calculated that we should have been able to make of calcium fluoride times 100 to get it into a percent, and that would give us an 81.2% yield, meaning we made a little over 80% of what we were supposed to have been able to make from this reaction. All right, hopefully we're feeling good about limiting reactant problems. If you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye, guys.